musical do you know the best? Probably Sound of Music. What are you? Cabaret. Mm. I can do Cabaret from start to finish. Yeah. But if you include Disney, oh yeah, yeah. Then, then I think it's... both of us can do um, Beauty and the Beast for sure. Yeah. Uh, Little, Little Mermaid. Mermaid. Aladdin. Yeah. I could do Pocahontas. I only know the big songs. Mm. Once the Moana. the mid nineties come on, I start falling off. Ah, uh, Moana. I can sing along to Moana. I think there's a lot of words I don't actually know. Oh, because see, when she I... goes, when the heaven and heaven, <laughs> it calls me. I don't actually know a lot of the words. I know all the words. Yeah, you're better at lyrics. Yes, that's always been my like weird talent. Couldn't do multiplication, but knows every lyric to a song. And we both know all of My Fair Lady. I think so, yeah. I sure do. I do, too. I was listening to it earlier um, while I was packing, and I was like, oh, I do know this very well. (laughs) Well, let's start off. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of I Love This, You Should Too. And we are members of the Alberta Podcast Network, which is locally grown and community supported. My name is Indy Bloody Knuckles Randawa, no. and with me is my fair lady, Samantha Randawa. Oh, that's nice. Indy does have bloody knuckles right now. But not from fighting. <laughs> no. Just from cycling. Falling off his bike. <laughs> first time ever. Yeah. I know, like, I didn't really bike as a kid, but this is the first time I've ever fallen off a bike. I feel so sad i just want to bandage you up yeah i could i could use it i think i'm quite bloody i will bandage you up once we're done here (laughs) he's not actively bleeding they're just open wounds yeah there's a little bit of active (laughs) bleeding okay um who would you play if you were in my fair lady who would i play yeah who would you like be want to be cast as well the role i would love to do is eliza Uh but i wouldn't get cast as eliza I would get cast as Henry Higgins because I, I'm i quite precise in my speech and I can't sing well. So that's why I'd be Henry Higgins. Yeah, and most of his is just like talk, talk singing. Talk singing. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to play Eliza. I think that'd be a fun role. That's the fun role because yeah. you get to do the transformation. Yeah. And I like doing accent work. So if you can like change your accent throughout. And the costumes. Oh, and the costumes. Oh, the costumes would be amazing. That too. Yeah. Um, that, or I'd like to be in the chorus and be one of the ascot people because those costumes are wild. Those are pretty good too. Yeah. Well, as you probably know, we are going to be talking about My Fair Lady today. But before we get into everything, let's thank our first sponsor. And this episode of I Love This, You Should Too is brought to you by Alberta Blue Cross. Even if you're a busy business owner with more meetings than hours in a day, you can be calm and collected when your group benefit plan is taken care of by Alberta Blue Cross. Your employees can manage their own health, dental, life, and disability coverage online anytime on any device, making it easier for them and for you. To learn more about Alberta Blue Cross and explore your options, head to ab.bluecross.ca. So My Fair Lady was my pick, but it's something that you're familiar with. Yes, quite. <laughs> so let's get into it. Let's go um, first thoughts. We'll each uh, kind of talk about what we took away from the movie. Mm-hmm. Then I want to go into a little bit of context about when the movie came out right. and uh, some controversy surrounding it then. Mm. And then we'll just kind of go through the movie. And I think... I'm not sure if it'll be the same for you, but there's a couple of questions, really, that I have about this movie that I'm not sure have been answered, and maybe we can answer them as we go through. Okay. So first impressions, or not first, maybe second impressions. What did you think? Um, I loved it, again. What do you love most? Um, probably... Eliza's transformation. Yeah. Like, you know, everybody loves like a makeover montage. True. And this is and a this three hour makeover. This movie is a makeover montage. Um, and I like how at the end she kind of claims her own like destiny. Does she? It's sort of. That's, well, I think you've already touched on it. That's my question. Yeah. I think she does because she's able to kind of strike out on her own towards the end of the film and goes to Mrs. Higgins' house. Right. I don't I don't actually I think that's her name. Mm-hmm. But um and she 
has this like backbone where she kind of stands up to Henry Higgins. True. And then like, yes, she goes back with him, but I think it's on a more even footing. And then the last line is him saying, where the devil are my slippers? And yeah. then putting the hat over his eyes. Yeah. That, that's always thrown me for like the ending because mm. it feels like she has like equal footing to him. It does. But then, yeah, he like, ends the show with a demand yeah so we'll get into it because that is pretty much my main issue Mm -hmm. with the movie it's where does it end up and is it a good ending what does the ending mean because a lot of people just assume like oh they get together and get married and i was like wait what (laughs) i didn't take that from this at all Hmm. so a lot of people think they get married uh, Henry Higgins and Eliza Doolittle. Yes, yeah, yeah. And a lot of people think that she is returning in a form of subservience. A lot of people think she is coming back to fight. I'm not sure, but we'll talk about okay. it. Okay. So I think what I loved about the movie most, what I didn't remember is how funny it is. Yeah. And how consistently funny it is throughout its giant runtime. Yes. Because this is a big movie and it's a big prestige piece. Mm -hmm. And it's also a period piece. And a lot of the times those movies are work to get through. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel the way that way with this. This one flew. It does. I I think if you're going to trim it down, though, I think... Rather than cutting songs, because I think those songs are mostly all good. Oh, yeah, and they're perfect for the plot. One of Henry Higgins' songs could be cut, because he has two songs pretty much that are the same. Like a wire women, women. Yeah, like, oh, women, they're the worst, eh? Yeah. That's pretty much what all two Aren't of his songs could be. old boy? Yeah. Yeah. So one of those could be cut, but I felt like the songs had too many verses. Yeah, and there's they a would, couple that... There would be a couple songs that have the same verse five times. Mm-hmm. You, could, you could, cut... could just cut one of those. Just cut a verse off each song. For sure. One or two. Yeah, but don't cut the actual spoken dialogue because it's almost all quite good. Yes, I agree. And I was kind of surprised that this movie does tackle some very tricky subjects. And later on in the second act or second half of the movie, Mm -hmm. it does so with surprising nuance and subtlety. But I'm still not sure about a few things, but we'll talk about those as we go. So the main thing that comes up a lot about this movie is Audrey Hepburn singing, or lack thereof. Yes, and it was she doesn't a sing. a big issue when this came out, and when you look at our current culture and kind of like the celebrity tabloid culture that we have, yeah. you think like, oh, we're the worst now. They were absolutely like that in the <laughs> yeah. 60s when I looked into how this movie came out. So, of course, uh, Pygmalion was by George Bernard Shaw. Mm -hmm. It is a play. It is this story. Yes. And much of the dialogue from this movie is from that play. Okay. And then it was turned into a stage play, or a stage musical, rather. And that's when it got the name My Fair Lady. This is still many years before the movie. Mm -hmm. And when rex harrison was the original henry higgins on stage Ah. and they floated the name lady liza and he said like no i'm not going to be in a play where the woman's name is the title oh so that sets up who rex harrison is right who by all accounts all contemporaneous articles everyone's like rex harrison is the best and anyone's lucky to work with him and i don't see it because i didn't grow up with rex harrison this is what i know him from and I honestly don't think he's great. No. I don't think he's bad. No. He's just kind of medium. And, like, I think Colonel Pickering is better than... He's more fun. Henry. But it, the thing is, like, you hate the character and you should hate the character? Yeah. Or should you? I think that's my other question is... A lot of people say this movie is misogynist. I say the character is, but the movie itself isn't. And I think that's an important distinction because I don't think we're meant to like Rex Harrison's Henry Higgins. Right. And if you do, that's kind of on you and you shouldn't. Yeah. Because he's, they take all opportunities to tell us it. Like this guy's an asshole. Yeah. The narration or the the chorus or some songs do it oftentimes too. Yeah. So and like I don't his think... song, Why Can't the English Learn How to Speak? Yeah. Like he just has like a hatred of his own people. He has a hatred of ever. No, he has a hatred of the poor and the foreigners. Right, yes. It's not his level of people. Yeah. 
I liked Colonel Pickering because he seemed to be the like opposite kind of sometimes of Henry, mm-hmm. um, where he like actually cared about Eliza and her well being and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So when this is a stage play, Julie Andrews plays Eliza Doolittle, mm-hmm. and to much acclaim, and that soundtrack I think was the top of the Billboard charts in the whatever year it was. Uh, the fifties, I think. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, it must be late 50s or early 60s. Yeah. But it's before the movie. And then they pay a huge sum to get the rights to make a movie. And even the rights to turn Pygmalion into the musical was mm-hmm. a big, long story in itself. I think um, Rogers and Hammerstein tried first. Oh. And were like, no, there's no musical here because there's no love story. You can't make a musical without a love story. And even in Pygmalion, the ending got changed multiple times, much to Shaw's dismay. And he, in some versions, if you went to see it, there's a big director's or um, writer's note on the back page of your playbill that says, like, this is what happens after. Don't believe the shit you're seeing up here, (laughs) which is kind of funny that That he went and did that. But uh, regardless of all of that, we get the ending we do. And... The role of Eliza, there was a lot of talk about who was going to play it. They bring back Rex Harrison. They talk to some other people, but Rex Harrison ends up coming back Mm -hmm. to reprise his role. And I think that's the same case for most of the other characters as well, that they were in the stage version Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't realize that. I thought it was just Rex Harrison and then... I believe Colonel Pickering and maybe his mother as well. Oh. But I don't think uh, Freddie... I think that's a new one. Oh, (laughs) Freddie. So then they aren't sure who to uh, cast as Eliza because Mm -hmm. this is, I think at the time, the largest American production money-wise ever. So they're putting a lot of money into this and they want to make sure they get that return. And at the time, Julie Andrews, we, of course, think of her as one of the biggest stars (laughs) of all time. she's in everything. But she wasn't then. She wasn't in movies. I think she had one movie ever. And she was just doing Broadway. Yes. Yeah. Which is like, yeah, I can't imagine because we grew up on the other side of Julie Andrews yeah. being famous that like, I can't your imagine. your career it. was kind of done by the time I was born. Yeah. Mostly. Like, and, and she has had a recurrence since, but like, it's, we have only know golden age Julie Andrews. Yeah. She was not a young ingenue no. to us. <laughs> Now, if you look at any contemporaneous reviews of it, they always demonize Audrey Hepburn because, like, how dare she do this to Julie Andrews? But that's kind of not what happened. That's just a press invention. Yeah. Because they asked Julie Andrews to test for it, do a screen test. Oh, well, they gave her a fair shot. And she refused. Oh, she refused? She refused to screen test for it. But that part's not talked about very much because Julie Andrews is the best and Audrey Hepburn's evil. Right, right, right. So she didn't do a screen test because she said, you've seen what I can do, which is fair. Yeah. True. I'm sure they had a video of the show on Broadway or whatever. But film is inherently different. Mm -hmm. And this is a new group of people. You're not working with their director from the stage. This is a whole new company. Everything's different. So they wanted her to come test. And she said, no, they go to Audrey Hepburn and they say, well, you do this role. And she says, no, it should go to Julie Andrews. And they tell her, if you don't do it, we're going to Elizabeth Taylor. And she already said yes. Oh. So then Audrey Hepburn's like, all right, come in. So then she (laughs) signs on. She makes a lot of money. But like we were saying, one of the big things is that she was dubbed. Mm -hmm. She didn't know this. Oh, really? She finds out on set. So she sings all of her songs. She trains and practices and sings. Oh, that's shitty. Yeah. I don't like that. The producers of this were, yeah, were kind of dicks in a few different ways. No kidding. I assumed, because like I knew that she was dubbed and I knew that uh, she sings like a little bit of Just You Wait. Right. Um, And I just assumed she didn't have the register to do it. Well, that is fair too, because they didn't change the the key at all. Mm -hmm. They made it all soprano and she can't can't hit that. So they could have just changed it, it which is a thing they do for for singers often. Oh, absolutely. They did not. And I guess they had no intention of letting her sing in the first place. (laughs) 
So <laughs> she finds out in the middle of production and she actually storms off the set nope, and says fair. like, oh, I'm not coming back because I'm I'm a singer. I'm going to do this. She comes back the next day and apologized to all of the cast and crew for her monstrous behavior oh. because she's Audrey Hepburn and she's a class act. It's hard to imagine <laughs> Audrey Hepburn doing anything monstrous. Yeah. <laughs> And she did say after this, she will never do another musical unless she is allowed to sing her own songs. Hmm. Did she ever do another musical? Well, I'm thinking now. Why can't I think of one? Not one that I love, at least. I've seen everything she's done. I think she sings a bit in Paris When It Sizzles, but it's not a musical. It's just like a, a madcap romp. Maybe she sings in that? Of course, she sings one song in Moon River <laughs> in, um, <laughs> oh, in yeah. Breakfast at Tiffany's. I'll have to go uh, look at my... Audrey Hepburn? notes i was gonna say in the on my bookshelf oh yes, i have yes. all of her movies but i could actually imdb is much easier yeah, yeah, it's true <laughs> um yeah i definitely i went through an audrey hepburn phase as like all young girls do i assume i sure did <laughs> and uh so that's why i know this one so well and also just because i i love musicals mm -hmm. but yeah i totally didn't know that story about this yeah, that was one of the big things. And when you look at anything from the time, that's what the biggest thing is. And it comes up then because this movie was nominated for 12 Oscars. So it does very well. Rex Harrison's nominated for Best Actor. Stanley Holloway is nominated for Best Supporting Actor. Gladys Cooper misses... Do a little... Or misses... Higgins. Higgins, yes. Is nominated for Best Supporting Actress. Oh. Notably missing out of these 12 nominations, anything for Audrey Hepburn. Because they really held it against her. Wow. And if you're going to hold it to her for singing, why not Rex Harrison? He doesn't sing either. Yeah. He couldn't sing, so then he just talks through the whole movie. Yeah, he just, it's, it's. A lot easier, it seems like, for the men to get away with not singing. I'm thinking of like Music Man too, where Harold Hill, the lead male, just kind of talks throughout the entire thing. No, it doesn't. And then Marnie Nixon. I think it's Marnie Nixon. Yes, I always get is. Marnie Nixon, who does lots of uh, ghost singing, they call it. Oh. And Marty Noxon, who is a producer from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I get them mixed up all the time. Oh, <laughs> No, it is Marnie Nixon, though. So she also said that she had a really hard time doing this because she had to try to match Audrey Hepburn's voice, which isn't the easiest voice to no, match. No, because she has a very distinct voice yeah. as well. And I don't know that she succeeded at matching it, but that's not on her because that's... Why Why is that whole thing happening, I guess? <laughs> True. And then uh, Freddie Einsford Hill yep. also didn't sing. Oh, really? Who sang for him? I'm not sure. But that actor who plays Freddy, professional singer. Oh. So he was shocked, too. He's like, no, I am I am a singer. Yeah. That is why I'm here. There's no reason to have me in this if I'm not going to sing. But no, they dubbed him, too. He was dubbed by Bill Shirley. I'm not sure about Bill Shirley, no. either. I was saying that, like, on the street where you live, there, this is, like, a time period where men sounded like this. Yes. This yeah, yeah, was, yeah. like, such a thing. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, man, it's, like, it's such a classic-sounding men's song. Yeah. <laughs> it's this, like, really high male singing voice. Oh, I never really thought of it as being high. It's pretty high on the scale of, like, men singing. So Rex Harrison wins an Oscar <sighs> for Best Actor, mm -hmm. which... I can't remember what else is in uh, 64, but <laughs> man, I think I, I just, I don't see it. Maybe it's because I came to this movie as an Audrey Hepburn fan and yeah. had no context of Rex Harrison, but I just didn't think he's doing anything particularly special here. No. But that's just us. And it also wins for Best Picture. Mm -hmm. Sure, it is no. oh, huge. It's, and it's beautiful. Best Director. That I take issue with. Oh. There is not a lot of direction. I feel like this is pointing a camera at pretty things. And also, it was already a stage play. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, I'll talk about that later, but like a lot of it looks like a stage play yes. still. Yes, yeah. It wins Best Art Direction, which, yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's beautiful. Best yeah. Cinematography. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Aren't they just pointing a camera at things that are pretty? Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of great work on going on behind the camera to me. 
True. Again, I'm picky. I picked this You're movie. You're picky. <laughs> I love this movie. I think it's a great movie. I don't think the cinematography is what makes it. It is the art direction and the costuming. And it, of course, won for best costume design, which makes sense. Won best score. Sure. Best sound as well. So it did very, very well. But no love for Audrey. Which I disagree. (laughs) Yeah. I wouldn't say this is even in her top, definitely not in her top three performances. Mm -hmm. Maybe not even in her top five. But if you're giving just everyone who's in a big movie and did something with it a a nomination, Mm -hmm. she's up there. It's to see that Mrs. Higgins got nominated and she didn't seems kind of crazy. Mrs. Higgins is in like 15 minutes of this three hour film. She's good. She's great. Yeah. She's like a stodgy old British lady. But to see Rex Harrison win and Audrey not even get nominated. What's really great though, if you ever want to see the oscar presentation to rex harrison Mm -hmm. it is audrey hepburn who who gives it to him and the way she says the words rex harrison when she opens the envelope it's the most charming thing you're going to see outside Uh of maybe audrey hepburn's uh screen tests for roman holiday when Uh she's just being herself talking about things she's just a a charming woman Hmm. yeah she's always struck me as a very charming woman and very polite Okay, well, I guess we should actually get into this movie. True. So, like you were saying, it looks like a stage play. It does. There's a couple pieces where that, like, really works out. Yeah. Um, Like, in the beginning, um, when everyone's coming out of the opera, because you need a lot of extras, and the extras are doing really good work. But that doesn't really rely on it looking like a stage play. And then... Like when they come out and they're doing, like, cause there's a couple points where they all kind of freeze. Oh, they do this thing where people kind of come out in shifts yes. and freeze. So it's strange. Like, are they going for realism? Because the first set, clearly a soundstage. Yes. It's definitely not a real street and there's no faking that. But are they trying to make it look like one? I would argue that at the beginning, it's trying to be as natural as possible. And I actually only noticed how bad the set looked now because we watched like the new 4K restoration. Right. Where everything looks better. And because it looks better, the sets look worse. Yeah. (laughs) Because you can just see like, oh, that's just like unfinished wood. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I I never found that an issue after the first like two minutes though, because you're just like, okay, that's what this world is. And I'm good. And you get sucked in. Yeah. What I do like is, we'll get there later, but the ascot scene and oh. how much they play with that artifice yes. later. I do love the ascot scene. So it's a rainy night. Everyone's getting out of the opera. We uh, meet Henry Higgins and my notes start off with the words, Henry Higgins is a dick. <laughs> yes. And uh, they should probably finish with those words as well. The end. And what I also didn't notice is at the beginning, the man who knocks into Liza, making her drop her flowers, is Freddy. Yeah. And Freddy doesn't care about her at all then. No. Because she's just some Some... poor cockney flower girl. Yeah. And we get introduced to Henry Higgins, who is a dick, and he's taking notes. And just some, like, weird guy warns Eliza. And then there's, like, the big argument and she just assumes that everyone is going to um, send her to jail. <laughs> yeah. Which, like, uh, the weird guy was the tea guy. The guy who was serving tea. The guy who warns her. Because the, there's, like, the tea cart yeah. right outside. Yeah, he was the one who was doing the tea. I liked her accent in the beginning of the movie. Did you? I do. I don't. Oh. I'm not going to say it's bad. I don't know what 1910 Cockney really sounds like. True. I don't know. I don't think it's this exactly. Mm. She's just so grating, though. True. And I guess that is very intentional. So I don't think that Hepburn did a bad job. It's just I have a hard time watching those Mm -hmm. scenes because she's just always going, ow. Yeah. (laughs) There's lots of shrieking. There is a lot of shrieking at the beginning. Um I like it. Again, I don't know also what they sounded like in 1910, but I think they picked an accent and she stuck with it. Sure, yeah. yeah. Because like sometimes, even now, you'll see movies where the accent comes and goes. Mm -hmm. And it's very like, 
what nationality is this person? And this one, it definitely comes and goes with great intention. Yes. And I think that is one of the best parts about her performance. Mm -hmm. Is that, yeah, and she sticks with it and all of her vowels sound the same usually. And um, yeah, and it comes and goes, which is fun. And Pickering and Higgins meet. Higgins sings his song about why can't the English learn to speak. Uh, He says that he could make Audrey Hepburn sound like a duchess Mm -hmm. and uh, work anywhere she wants. And then we get her singing Wouldn't It Be Loverly, Mm -hmm. which is, I don't know if it's my favorite song, but it's definitely in contention. I really like that song. Why can't the English learn to speak? Not in my favorites. No. Um, I think Wouldn't It Be Loverly is definitely... It's like a like a charming song. It might be the best song, but I think my favorites aren't the ones that are also the best. I think it's a difference for me. Because mm. Just You Wait, Henry Higgins is maybe my favorite song. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then he catches her at the end. Yeah. And I like how they're set up because his first song just solidifies the fact that he's an asshole. Mm-hmm. And her first song, so we get this one impression of her, and she's very argumentative, but her first song makes her just so charming. Yeah. And you can see that she's, like, smart in that song. And it's also a great song to let us empathize with where mm-hmm. she's coming from. She doesn't want grandeur. She just wants safety. All I want is a room somewhere. Yeah. If you've been listening to the podcast, you know that I am deep in John Steinbeck right now. <laughs> and that is like a through line through so many of his novels. Just everyone just wants like, oh, I just want a place to myself where I can just tend the land. But uh, the lower classes, they just can't. They yeah. can't have anything. That's all I want is a room somewhere far away from the cold nights air. Yeah. So Eliza thinks about what he said and then shows up Yeah, and says, all right, I'll take those yeah. lessons, please. And she offers to pay, which is nice. Yeah. And she is like, has a reason for why she's going to pay what she pays. Because she says she has a friend who gives French lessons. Yeah. And she shouldn't have to pay that much yeah, if she's learning her own language. That's true. So, yeah, I liked that she, like, she seems smart in that scene, too, where she's like, no, I've, like, thought this through. I know how much I should be paying, and I won't go penny over it. Like, it's it's very, she, she seems very strong in that scene, too. Yeah, we talked about Pretty Woman just a few weeks ago. And go check out that episode because this is a companion piece to oh, that, sure. really. Yeah. And that was the same thing that we have this image of, oh, the woman was just like bought in both of these movies. But it starts out on their terms. Mm-hmm. Pretty Woman, I would definitely say, ends up being a feminist movie. My Fair Lady, I'm on the fence about still. Mm. And that's what we're talking about today. Yes. <laughs> and then, of course, he calls her baggage and gets her like, Put upstairs and they forcibly strip and wash her. Yeah, which is like, that would be traumatic for anybody. Yeah. But especially for someone, she says she's never had a bath before, which like back then. That's a thing. It's a thing. You catch your death. Yeah. You don't get fully submerged. Yeah. I love when she sees the tub and she's like, in there. <laughs> yeah. Like you, that was, that was a thing. You kind of just like sponged yourself off at the end of the day. And London was so dirty that, you know, you're never really clean. True. So yeah, I, I think it's fun to see her experience these like little luxuries that we would think of as just like regular. And they also talk about, well, what is the situation going to be? Mm -hmm. And Pickering asks, like, are you a gentleman where women are concerned? And Mm -hmm. he's like, nobody is. And he has these lines about, like, she doesn't have feelings. Also, all men treat all women bad, so it's fine what I'm doing. And he has a thing about uh, paying her. And then he says, like, oh, she'd only drink if we gave her money. Yeah. So he's... Like, I know he's a, like, a dick. He's supposed to be an unlikable character. Mm-hmm. Or he's supposed to be, like, I think he's supposed to just be a kind of charming curmudgeon. Yeah. But to me, I, like, I just hate him. I don't like it's him. It's too far for me. Yeah. And maybe that's because we are who we are in the time that we are. Yes. It, it could very well be that. But with those lines, but he just says it, like, casually. Mm. So I think we're supposed to just let it slide. Right. But it, it's it's tough. 
But he does say that you're going to stay here for the next six months. I'm going to teach you how to speak beautifully like a lady in a florist shop. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do this, uh, the angels will weep for you. And if you don't behave, we'll wallop you and starve you. (laughs) And she's like, all right, I'm down. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think living in a house is also like she's getting part of her wish. Yeah, true. From her, her, her first song. So I think... She's thinking that, like, how bad can it be if I'm getting, like, food and warmth? Yeah, she literally sang a song about wanting this. So. Yeah, and she's getting pretty much all of it. All the chocolate. <laughs> so then he sings his second song, the, um, I'm an ordinary man. Right. But let a woman in your life. Yeah, about how women just ruin your life. Yeah, so his first song is about how poor people and foreigners are ruining the country. Yeah. And his second song is about how women ruin everything. And this song is maybe my least favorite, not just subject wise, because all of his songs are like, I, and I think they're supposed to be over the top mm-hmm. and, and funny because he's so stuck in his ways and so backwards or whatever it is. But it's also just not a good song, this one. Mm. It doesn't have any sort of flow to it. It's a hard song to sing along with because, well, he doesn't sing. No, he and kind of talks melodically. But in this one, it's not even melodic. There's a lot of really abrupt, but let a woman in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Like those parts. I don't, it's my least favorite song, maybe. It's very shouty. Yeah, it is very shouty. Yeah. Whereas like, why can't the English are a little bit, it's a little bit more melodic than this one. This one That's one you can sing with. This one's like a lecture. It is. An angry lecture in the form of kind of song. So then we go back to Covent Garden and... Eliza's dad, Alfred Alfie? P. Doodle, Doolittle, is uh, doing his bit and he sings with a little bit of luck, which, so this one, also a terrible uh, meanings, yeah. but a fun song. It's a fun song. It's a good song. And I it's like got it. some good like melody moments yes. with the chorus. And uh, I like the dance. <laughs> like it's, it's a fun way they present it in the movie. Yeah. It's funny that this is a giant musical, hardly any dancing. No, it's just, I guess, of the time. The yeah. musicals of this time didn't have as much dancing. Yeah, there isn't, like, full chorus They're like, hey, we're breaks. no Fred Astaire. Yeah. We're more the new age of this. I uh, I like that this one has some dancing in it, too. I think it needs more. If you're going to do a musical, you should dance more. True. I like how Alfie finds out that his daughter's left Covent Garden. Oh, yeah, just some woman says, like, hey, Alfie. <laughs> yeah, and is, like, handing her belongings out the window. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I think that he requests five pounds from Higgins is really telling of his situation too. Mm -hmm. Like, I think he's kind of happy where he is because... That's the thing, because Higgins offers him 10. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, 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 that's too much for me. If I had 10, I would have to do all of these things. So he sets it up quite early. And this, the Alfie stuff, is some of the most interesting stuff, which I never really paid attention to. But when you look at what he's saying, if you actually listen to all of it, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Because he says... I'm not pretending to be deserving. I'm undeserving and I know it. And I'm going to go on being undeserving because I love what I'm doing yeah. right now. But you know what? If everyone else is getting a little bit of money, why can't I have five pounds? Yeah. And it's such a strange and backwards like a set of mor- morals that he mm-hmm. has. And I guess Higgins does comment on it because he says he should be a, is it a morality instructor? Something like that. Yeah. A some philosopher kind of philosopher, something, philosopher yeah. lecturer or something like that yeah and then he says like oh well yeah if you were having sex with her then you'd have to pay me 50 and right. then you're like oh wait so you would totally just sell your daughter cool good to know i yeah yeah that's like like there's some stuff that just kind of floats by you because it's like a fun song mm-hmm and, like, it's, like, he's got such a crazy speech, yeah, like, sound that you kind of miss some of it. And it's, like, ooh. Yeah. Ooh, that's not great. <laughs> well, his first song is all about, like, yeah, women are great, but if you're lucky, they'll just cook and clean for you and you won't have to marry them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Kids are great and uh, you should take care of them. I won't. But if you're lucky, they'll take care of you. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But it's, like, all done up in a fun song. Yeah. So who cares? And then we go back to the house. 
This is the Just You Wait Henry Higgins yes. part. And I really love this scene. It's one mm-hmm. of my favorites because she has this dream sequence. And I think what Audrey Hepburn doesn't get nearly enough credit for is her comedy. Mm-hmm. And it's not just comedic timing, which I think she is good at. Maybe not like great. She's not a, the best comedian out there. But we talk about, oh, we love people like Jim Carrey because they do all sorts of crazy faces. Yeah. Personally, that just annoys me. Yeah. But her face acting oh, is Oh my hilarious. goodness. And her physical, like yeah. the way she moves and stuff in some scenes. The A lot of... Reviews from the time talk about how, like, oh, she's too elegant to ever pull this off. I think she has, like, a certain amount of gawkiness to her. Mm -hmm. Much like Julia Roberts in Pretty Woman. And that's why I drew that parallel in the first place, was their physical performances were similar in a lot of ways. That there is definite elegance there, as we see later, but it comes from this awkwardness first. I think... Like, I, what I know about Audrey Hepburn, she was, like, a ballerina. Mm-hmm. And I think... <laughs> she having... did ballet to raise money for the Res- Dutch resistance. Yeah. Um, and I think having been a ballerina, it's, like, something you learn and that you can kind of turn on and off. And yeah. I, I was very tall and very thin um, when I was younger. And, yeah, there is, like, a certain gawky uncomfortableness when you're not doing ballet and i think that that's what audrey hepburn takes advantage of in this movie is that kind of like off switch from ballet then there's the poor professor higgins sequence and this is what i mean when i talk about i think the movie itself is on our side Mm -hmm. because they're doing this poor professor higgins song he doesn't eat he can't sleep but in that scene he's actually eating yes so I think the movie is mocking him and being like, oh, poor Professor Higgins. Yeah. I think it's quite sarcastic. And I didn't catch that probably in my first time around. Because how often do you hear a sarcastic chorus in a musical? Very <laughs> true. And like sarcastic servants. Yeah. Because that's like their job is to serve him and keep him happy. And that's where their wages come from. So like they probably wouldn't be super sarcastic, but it's kind of fun to get that like look into their minds. And then Eliza has her big breakthrough and she does the rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. And also in, what were the places? Hartford, Hereford, Hereford, and Hampshire. Hampshire. Hurricanes hardly ever happen. Um, Yeah, this is a fun one because you get to see all three of them together and like happy, Mm -hmm. which doesn't really happen for the rest of the movie. Yeah. It's this one moment where they're all very happy together. And... This leads into I Could Have Danced All Night. Mm, Yes. And I don't know what to take away from that song because she says that I only know that when he began to dance with me, I could have danced all night. So is she falling in love with him at this point? I think she has uh, Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah. (laughs) I think she's like so starved for like positive encouragement and like friendship even that she's just like, oh, that that was wonderful because he actually like paid attention to me. I'm yeah, I'm not sure what to take about it because it's not another character. It's her singing this. And she's not singing about her own accomplishment, but rather about him and how he makes her feel. Mm -hmm. So this kind of goes in the face of what I was thinking about how she, because later on she says like, no, as a friend, there's nothing romantic here. Mm -hmm. But the line of like, when he began to dance with me, I could have danced all night makes it seem very romantic to me. Yeah. And I I get what you're saying because she, once we meet her father, we see that she's been abused by men her whole life. And this is the the only bit of affection she's ever received. So I get why she would attach to that. And like, it's this dreamy sequence, but it is very sad because it's not. He's not doing anything. It's not true. Yeah. (laughs) It's not. He doesn't like appreciate her efforts. He appreciates that he's closer to winning the bet, which has nothing to do with Eliza. That's like, I think we all have a friend who will be like, oh, my boyfriend made dinner for me. I'm so lucky. Yeah. Like, yeah, once, but he's a dick the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you need to get some higher standards. And Eliza also needs some higher standards. But 
You know what? Actually, maybe I'm I'm getting it now because this is when she is still. I don't know what word we want to use. They use the word lady a lot. Then mm-hmm. she becomes a lady later. Yeah. And if we use the the same vocabulary, let's use lady to mean not just someone who is polished and refined, mm-hmm. but someone who has a sense of self and a certain bearing that comes from confidence and not just speech patterns. Right. And this is before that. Yes. She's so, so she's, she's a her, like, child. Teenager years. Yeah. Yeah. Where she's trying to figure everything out. Yeah, so she hasn't become that. She hasn't gained that confidence. Right. So maybe in that state, any little bit of affection like this, and she's is like a child who just falls in love and like a like a teenager. Yeah, right? like a crush or like yeah. whatever. It's like, oh he he looked over at me twice during math right, class. Right, yeah. Oh, it must be love. Like that kind of feeling. Mm-hmm. That's definitely something that you feel in that scene. That makes more sense to me. And then as she grows and as her voice changes in accompaniment with that, mm-hmm. then we get to really see how she feels as a as a full like adult, a full lady, a fully developed human. Yes, yeah. A full lady. <laughs> full lady. She goes full lady by the she end. She does. And then we go to the Ascot race course scene. And this is the most stylized mm-hmm. part of, of any of it. Not much of it looks like the real world, but this looks very far removed. Between the costumes and the set, it looks more like an 80s new wave video. <laughs> it doesn't look anything like like the 60s or the early 1900s at all. Mm-hmm. I really liked this one. Um, and the song. The song that's like so... It's very flat. It's monotone, but the lyrics are about how amazing, how thrilling this is. So I appreciated this because it is very much like a suppression of emotion like an actual upper class person would have been. Only now am I really realizing how much this movie makes fun of the upper class. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought when I was a kid and saw this, that it is an upper class movie about how you can get there. Yeah. And now you look at it and you're like, no, this is pretty satirical. They're making fun of these people a lot. And how like stuck up and stuffy everyone is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I like Ascot opening day because it's like, it's this like, it goes do, 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 do. And it's just very like, one set of notes over and over again and it's very um even when the horses come by they're like oh so thrilling yeah nobody moves (laughs) yeah and everyone just kind of turns and puts their glasses up and then turns back to whatever they're doing and i like um i like that i thought it was fun and i like how they're promenading in that little pen yeah (gasps) i agree with all of that, but I also think that it goes on for a little too long. It, it's very There long. is a long portion of no words being spoken or sung and just the moving. Mm-hmm. And it could it could be cut down a little bit, I think. <laughs> I also love that his mother is embarrassed by him. Yes. And I like that because we have experienced him belittling Eliza only. Mm-hmm. And then we get to see him go in a place where he is the uncouth one. Yes. And how embarrassed his mother is. His mother is one of the only people who's nice to Eliza, too. Yeah, Colonel Pickering and, and, yeah. and Mrs. Higgins. Yes. So it's it's nice to see how she kind of reassures Eliza throughout that scene where they're sitting and talking. Maybe my favorite part of the movie, definitely in the top <laughs> five, is the next bit when we get to see... Audrey Hepburn doing this voice, which yeah. is in between her two things. So she has her speech, the pronunciation down, yeah, but has the strangest <laughs> affectation of somebody trying to be fancy, yeah, but still having the vocabulary, vocabulary yeah. <laughs> and the subject matter that she would have had before. And I think it's brilliantly funny. Yeah. I love that bit. Them that's pinched it done her in is yes. one of my favorite lines. Because <laughs> she delivers it as if she were a duchess. Drank my word something chronic. <laughs> yeah. But all the words she's saying, old Eliza probably would have said yeah. in the opening scene. Yes, definitely. Um, but she's delivering it in that posh tone of voice. Or what she thinks a posh tone of yes, voice is. Yes, yes. 
gin with mother's milk. <laughs> that's one of my favorite. That's, favorites that's too. such a good one, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, it ends with the "Come on, Dover, move your blooming ass," which is an exact scene from Pretty Woman, too. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I love when she shows the spirited version of herself mm-hmm. in these little flashes. Yeah. And it's more obvious here as opposed to later in the film. But yeah, it's fun because her eyes light up and she gets this like really like full character on her face. Especially when she looks half asleep through the the prior speech when yeah. she's trying to be all, all oh, articulate. Yeah, because she's got that like really placid face. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden the race starts and she's like, oh she my God, alive. this is fun. I know we talked about it a lot in the Pretty Woman episode, but now we can really see how much Julia Roberts borrowed from, yes. from this performance. Oh, for sure. So then she met Freddy there, and he is now in love with her. So he comes to her house, and she's not there, and she doesn't want to see him, and she doesn't want to see anyone. Ever again. I, I get <laughs> When when we watched that, I said, yeah, me too. I get that. <laughs> um, is this the first occurrence of a man just deciding he loves her and then stalking her? Oh, no. <laughs> it can't be. Because Freddie's like, oh, I spend most of my nights on your street. Yeah. Which is creepy. Yeah. And if he wasn't like the romantic interest in this movie. But is he? Mm, He's romantically interested in her for yes. sure. Is she? I don't, I don't know. So. That's another debatable thing. Yeah. Um, I do love the On the Street Where You Live song. It's a very good song. Oh, it's like, oh, it's so good. And it's such a a sound, like it sounds like that period of time. Men don't sing like that anymore. And the street just looks beautiful too. So time passes and now it is the night of the big ball. And Eliza comes down and she's all beautiful and elegant and actually maybe more understated in her dress than many of the others, mm-hmm. but has a certain simplistic elegance to her, but has very elaborate hair. And like a huge necklace on. Yes. Yeah. Did, um, I wish they had shown a little bit of a montage of her getting ready. Yes. Like that's, that's the montage. There, there are a lot of instances in this movie that they don't take advantage of the fact that they're doing a movie. Mm-hmm. This could be as it is on stage. Yeah. You're not on stage. You cut. Yeah. Cut. Move the camera. Show us like little like clips of her getting makeup and hair and like. Or some that more. That could be a funny scene too. Of the transformation of who she was in that last one where she's doing that real weird impression of a rich person <laughs> yeah. to who she becomes when she's now like a, a truly elegant lady. Mm-hmm. There was more work there, but we don't get to see that. We instead see a lot of shots of people silently moving around, Mm -hmm. which I feel like could have been cut out. Yes, I agree. But she comes down, we have the big reveal, and it's like she's this sparkling beauty. And I like that reveal. Mm -hmm. I I aspire to look that good. (laughs) Don't we all? Ever. Um... And I like how she stands there because Higgins has taught her all of these things yeah. and Colonel Pickering has taught her all these manners and everything. But Higgins doesn't follow through no. on his own teaching. And so she stands there and waits until he comes back in and offers her his arm, which I think is like kind of a fun little comeuppance. You're like, it's like a little I know this better than you thing. know this. It's like, ahem. <laughs> like... Um, so I think that's like, there's little things like that where that she does so well. And then in one of my most disappointing scenes, perhaps the whole ball, Mm -hmm. I didn't love it. No, no. I think it was gorgeous because of course there's like lots of beautiful things in that shot. I think relative to the other stuff, it wasn't Mm -hmm. like it is, but the amount of detail that's in Henry Higgins is house Mm -hmm. or on the streets there's a lot more to it in this big opulent ball it seems rather plain Mm. relative to all of that there's no like big chandeliers or artwork it's it's a big room right so i was a little disappointed in that and then also the movie has been leading to this scene yes everything is all about this and what i would have loved to have seen is her talking yes 
her talking to people. Maybe she gets in a bit of a sticky situation, has to talk her way out of it. That's true. She has that charm, and we know now she has that comedic ability, mm-hmm. too. That's what I want to see. But instead, we get this like weird thing about the imposterologist who could seek out imposters. Yeah. That's like, what does not that even necessary. Mean? You already have all of these rich people. Those are your imposterologists. Mm-hmm. You don't need to focus it on one character. Yeah. And then rather than showing her and letting us hear her convince him, it's all silent. And she just kind of moves around the room. Yeah, I wish we did get a little bit more. Even just more Mike of her speaking to people. Yeah. Yeah. And this whole movie is about changing the way she speaks. We get into like the smallest details of phonetics. And yet in the big scene where she gets to show off how she sounds, she doesn't talk. Yeah. That's just a missed opportunity and a very strange one. And she just like. Strange choice. We see her move and curtsy and dance. Yeah. But we don't get to. And then just be beautiful because when whoever it is, the princess or whatever who comes by, just looks at her and goes, how charming. Oh, the queen of Transylvania. Oh, the queen. She was the queen. (laughs) She's the queen of Transylvania. Yeah. Um, Which like, that's nice that the queen thought she was beautiful. But like. We just hear her say, how do you do five times? Exactly. I want to see her talk. How kind of you to let me come. (laughs) (laughs) I think we should bring that into normal speech again. Oh, I say that anytime I visit someone's house. Oh, okay. How kind of you to let me come. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was disappointed with that. But then she comes back to Henry Higgins' place and she comes back very disillusioned, mm-hmm. I'd say. And this is one of the things that made me really like this movie because they do touch on this. She realizes this. I don't know if this is just my reading. I think it's right out there that she realizes that one's position in life isn't earned. Mm -hmm. These people are not any better than her. Mm -hmm. It is simply that they speak a a specific way. And if you do that, you you're in. Yeah. It's shows that her like this escape from the lower classes is not a revolutionary act. Mm-hmm. It is not something done with hard work. It is simply inherited. Mm-hmm. And she comes back and she's like, oh, that's it. Yeah. And then also, I like that she says, like, basically, she's like, you raised me too high. Because now, I, what am I good for? Oh, yeah. Well, let's like, get there. Because yeah. first, there's the um, nobody gives her credit and... Right. They sing the You Did It song. You did it, yeah. All about congratulating Higgins. And they keep she keeps thinking that they are going to go to her next, but then they just move on to yeah. someone else. Like, oh actually, Pickering, you did a good job. Yeah. Too. And then we get into the bit where they all go to sleep and she stays up and is just crying. Yeah. And then we have this scene and it's them telling each other off. And I think this was brilliant. Yes. Because This is why I will come down on the side that this is not a misogynistic movie. Mm -hmm. He, it just features prominently a misogynist. Yes. And they are a little too easy on him. I'll give you that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the movie takes that point of view because of her speech in this Mm -hmm. specifically. But then all those other things like the, the servants are kind of mocking him and his mother also is on Eliza's side. Yes. And then Colonel Pickering, too. So it really is just him that is in his way of thinking. Yeah. But yeah, then we get into the bit. And she says, like, well, I won the bet. And he's like, you presumptuous insect. Yeah. He just always calls her the worst Yeah. Things. He has some really uh, terrible names for her. Yeah. Throughout the entire... And they'd be hilarious if it wasn't so devastating. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. And she even says, like, I wish I were dead. Mm -hmm. And then she has that part that you were talking about. The the what's to become of me? What am I fit for? What have you left me fit for? Where am I to go? What am I to do? And what's to become of me? Yeah. And he's like, oh, you can marry well. (laughs) Do you remember her response to that? No. No, I, I can't think of it. She says, we were above that in Covent Garden. Right. I sold flowers. I didn't sell myself. Now you've made a lady of me and I'm not fit to sell anything else. Mm. And that line. Yeah. 
that's like that cuts to the heart of when I make an argument about why this movie isn't bullshit. Mm-hmm. That's the line yes. I would draw. One hundred percent. Because it's her rising realize what it took to get there Mm -hmm. realizing it's not work realizing that this whole structure is just a bunch of bullshit and it's a also like a really great commentary on the state of women at the time right Mm -hmm. because she's saying like you lifted me up but i'm no better off because she is still a woman she's not going to be able to go out and do whatever she no, wants no she can't start a business or if anything anything she has less freedom now mm-hmm. than she did before because before she answered to nobody yeah but now she can't just go out and sell flowers no and she like all she wanted was to be like a lady in a flower shop yeah and now she's too fancy for that mm-hmm. and if she is right to blame him for that because she had a request. She said, this is where I want to be and I want English lessons. But she was never a full person. No. To Henry Higgins. No. Your live doll. Yeah. yeah, Aren't you a pair of pretty babies playing with your live doll? (laughs) I love Mrs. Higgins. She's very good. She's got some really sharp lines Mm -hmm. and uh, she comes in at the right moments and uh, yeah, she's great. (laughs) So then she leaves, and there's also a really good scene that uh, really mirrors that scene in Pretty Woman when Mm -hmm. she's leaving about, like, well, what's mine? I don't want to be accused of stealing anything because... And I... What I hated so much, but in a good way, I hated when Henry Higgins says, like, oh, you've you've hurt me. You've cut me into the heart. Yeah. Fuck you. You were so mean to her for, like, six months. And now that she is responding in the way that you treat her, you're like, oh, you've wounded me. What a horrible, ungrateful person. What a dick that guy is. He is a dick. And then she goes out and meets uh, Freddie, who is waiting. And I love she sings uh, the words, words, words. I'm so sick of words. Oh, that's another really good song from this one. one. Show me. Show me. Yeah. Don't talk of stars burning above. If you're in love, show me. Yeah. All of her lines in that are very good. And she delivers it. And I know this is like not her singing, but she really delivers it. Like she's actually just irritated with all men. Yeah. And but it, she's the one acting yeah. though. And that's where it comes through yes. more than in the vocals. Very true. And then she leaves there, goes back to Covent Garden and she tries to go home, but she doesn't belong there anymore. Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, miss, can I get you a taxi? Yeah. You shouldn't be out here alone. A woman like you should not be out here. And that's the equivalent of that whole, um, I never treated you like a prostitute, you just did, bit from Pretty Woman. Because now she's aware of how bad she had it before. Because they're saying, a woman like you shouldn't be out here. But that old you, who you really are, yeah, you don't, no one should watch out for you. No, no. So it's people helping her, trying to help her, only prove Like, what a sad state she's in. Mm -hmm. And how, yeah, she, like, no longer fits anywhere. Because she's not high-born or, like, she doesn't have, like, a good family lineage, which would have been important at this time. Yes, definitely. And so... And that's that's what she's learning. It's all inherited. It's not who you are, actually. So she no longer fits in her old life. She doesn't have the pedigree or the background to be in her quote-unquote like new life Mm -hmm. and so yeah she's like where do i go yeah what do i do stupid henry higgins and then she meets her father yes who is going through kind of his uh, a very similar analogous situation and said that uh he's tied me up and delivered me into the hands of middle class morality (laughs) because the letter that he has um the housekeeper write to this american teacher or guy i can't remember what he was wealthy american guy and so i guess he died and left everything to alfie yeah he's in the same situation that he's too rich to not live that kind of life so he's complaining that now he has to make an honest woman out of his mistress and he has to get married but then he says he can't give back the money because he just he just doesn't have the nerve or the courage to do it. <laughs> and I get that too. Yeah. Uh, get Me to the Church on Time is like one of the only times where we got like a full company dance scene. Yeah. And it's fun. It's a fun one in the like pub it. and everything. And everyone's like 
dancing on tables and stuff and it's uh it's fun especially um i like how they it's kind of stage play-ish but they get alfie and those two girls under the table and then they lift the table off and you see that they're under there right like it's it's moments like that that are like kind of charming and there the camera is more active as well Mm -hmm. i wish that liveliness was was more in the movie yeah you can see it like traveling through the pub Mm -hmm. because it's kind of from the perspective of someone like and we actually get to see around an interior place yeah the rest of the time we get everything like a like a stage play or like a sitcom. Yeah, where you get like the three wall set up. Specific sets and you don't really go outside of those, yeah. And then the next morning Henry Higgins wakes up and he's like, What could have possessed her to leave? I have no idea. Despite that entire argument they just <laughs> yeah. had where she says exactly what she means. Mm-hmm. And then so that's why things like his next song, which is Why Can't a Woman Be More Like a Man? I feel like the movie definitely isn't taking his side because he goes on about, oh, women are so irrational. While we just had a very salient argument made by her. And then he's like, why would she do this? I have no idea. So clearly women aren't the problem. So I, again, I don't think this movie takes Henry Higgins' side. No, I, I would agree with you on that. So then Eliza turns up at Mrs. Higgins' house and uh, I just, like, love how throughout the entire movie, Mrs. Higgins is just, like, mad at her son for being who he is. He's a piece of shit. He, she's the only person who kind of sees what the audience sees throughout the movie. Yeah. Because yeah, all Pickering of, like, does is, like, oh, now, professor. Yeah. And Nothing more than she's that. She's, like, you can't treat people like this. Mm-hmm. She is a human being. And um, so... I like this scene where Higgins shows up at his mother's house and Eliza plays the game back at him, right? Like, she's like, oh, well, I've been, you know, taught to be like this. And Mm -hmm. she gives it right back to him, which is perfect. I think my favorite line in that uh, sequence is when she says, the difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves, but how she is treated. Mm -hmm. And that was brilliant, too. Yeah. And then the song is thematically maybe my favorite song even (laughs) if it's not my favorite actual song yeah the um without you yeah it's like you're not the center of the universe and that's the (laughs) best way it's not like hey you're a piece of garbage here are the bad things you're doing it's just like you know what everything's gonna go on just fine without you yeah england still will be be spring every year without you yeah england still will be here without you There'll be fruit on a tree and a shore be a, by the sea. Yeah. Shore by the sea. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it's such a good moment because she is like the strongest that she is. Throughout. But then in very Higgins fashion and kind of encapsulating my feelings on this movie altogether, which is a little complicated, he ruins the song because she's go doing her big without you at the end and he interrupts. And even if you're listening on the soundtrack, you don't get her final word, no. which always bothers me when I'm hearing it Yeah, true. because he interrupts with, I did it. I did it. <laughs> and that's my biggest like, fuck you. Shut up. Yeah. Sit down and shut up for once. Listen to your mother. Yeah. Cause she's right. <laughs> he kind of um, predicts our, current rhetoric about guys like this who just whatever you do there's like no i did that Mm -hmm. it's very um there's so many different ways and um every woman in a office will have a story of this yeah it could be as big as donald trump taking credit for the two koreas getting together he's like no i did that that was was me (laughs) it's something great happened. He's like, yeah, that's what I wanted the whole time. It's like men in meetings being like, oh, here's an idea when you just presented that like two minutes ago. Just said that. Just said that. And in this, somewhere he also says the line uh, when he's trying to bring her back, like, she belongs to me. I paid five pounds for her. Yeah. Oh, this piece of shit. Like, you belong at my house. Like, it's like like she's a book. I purchased you. Yeah. Yeah. So that I did it makes me angry. That's what it makes me think that I'm not sure w- how far the movie takes this. Mm-hmm. Because they let him kind of get the last word. I guess you could say that her last word is the, um, the silence and just being like, okay, then fine, I'm done with this. Yeah, bye. But <laughs> to the audience, it kind of plays like, oh yeah, he did do it. 
Mm-hmm. And there's people out there who watch it and are like, yep, that's it. Just in the same way that there's people who watch American Psycho and Taxi Driver and be like, oh, yeah, that guy's great. And you're like, no, 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 that's not the point of this no, movie. No, no, no. I feel like that might be the case with Henry Higgins. I mm-hmm. think people are like, yes, he gave her that strength. And I don't feel like the movie goes far enough because they let him come in and interrupt her big song. Right. That kind of seems symbolic of like maybe the movie is like, yeah, he kind of did do it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I don't. I just wish it would be um, more condemning of Higgins. Yeah. Yeah, they do kind of like there's a moment during Without You and when his mother is like, you're an idiot. Um where they're coming down really hard on him and then they kind of ease up at the end. And that's it. Yeah, and he interrupts and takes over. Yeah. And, and they, makes it about himself him. again. Yeah. And she does go with, goodbye, Professor Higgins. You shall not be seeing me again. Yeah. And maybe that is a better a better ending because she is shutting it down on her own terms. But in a musical it kind of seems like to get the last word, you should have that last song. Mm-hmm. So I wish that, I wish she hadn't been interrupted by another I Did It song. Mm-hmm. Or if that came first and then she sang Without You, I think that would have been more powerful. Yeah, more I agree. I agree. For like what we're dealing with in the movie, I definitely think she should have had the last song in that scene. And then his kind of acknowledgement of her humanity even <laughs> yeah. is just the I've grown accustomed to her face song. Yeah. Which, which again isn't a like, you know what, she is great, she's learned all this. It's just like, yeah, I've grown accustomed to her face. Yeah. Like he does kind of realize that he's been a dick, but he also doesn't He doesn't learn a lot. No, know he, he doesn't learn lesson. anything. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Like, he doesn't, he's like, oh, maybe I was kind of hard on her. But his biggest argument is like, oh, yeah, but I treat everyone like garbage. <laughs> Just make you a good person. Right? <laughs> he's like, oh, no, I do treat you like a duchess, but fuck duchesses too. I'm a piece of shit. I only look out for me and maybe my boy, Colonel Pickering. Yeah, exactly. But only because Colonel Pickering is so easy on him. Yeah. <laughs> Colonel Pickering's like his yes man. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Because the worst he'll do is like, oh, now Higgins. No, think about this. Yeah. yeah. So then we have him in his home. He's listening to the tapes. He, or probably not tapes, phonographs, wax cylinders, whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, he's listening to those and kind of reminiscing about her. And then she walks in. And I would say without learning his lesson on why he may have lost her and he doesn't reflect on who he is and how she has grown. Mm -hmm. He's just like, Oh yeah. Yeah. She was fun. You know what? She was good to have around here. And then she walks in and all she says is I washed my hands before I come. I did like, she kind of plays with what he's been listening to. Yeah. And then all he does is say, Eliza, where the devil are my slippers? Puts his hat over his eyes and like kicks his feet up. Yeah. And that's where it ends. I don't understand why that's the ending. That's why I feel like the movie, it gives mixed messages because we had the kind of omniscient chorus calling Mm -hmm. him out. We had her calling him out in these great songs. We had the mom telling him what's wrong with him. We see this great performance of Hepburn going from this kind of weak-willed, just trying to do what it takes, learn the world and being naive, Mm -hmm. to someone who doesn't just mimic what a lady is, doesn't just have better speech, but rather has a true strength of character and a sense of self now. Mm -hmm. We have all of that. But the last word is this motherfucker with his where the devil are my slippers and kicking his feet up. I think they should have cut that line. Yeah, they should have cut that line. (laughs) They could have cut this whole scene, honestly, but I think just like don't let him have the last word. I agree. Yeah. Because then you're like, oh, so she just comes back and they go back to how it was? Mm -hmm. Or you could look into it and say like, okay, well, now they realize that they are each other's match and they're going to continue on as friends. Because she does have that line about, I I do 
have fondness for you, but as a friend, I don't want to make love to you. I want to be your friend. Mm-hmm. There's like, there's something about that. So we know that she's not really romantically interested. Yeah. We're not sure if he is. I don't think he is. Uh, does he feel romance? That's another question. Because he seems very, like, I don't, like, one track mind kind of thing. Yeah. Like, he just wants to. He's a confirmed bachelor. He's a confirmed bachelor. Um, But yeah, it seems like all he wants to do is language and be the best at that and, like, fuck women, right? Like, that's. But not in that way. Yeah. But not, he wants to live a life where women aren't in the way. Yes. Um. And yeah, so I I don't know. I'd like to think she returns and becomes his like assistant or like protege mm-hmm. to be a languageologist <laughs> or whatever he is. Linguist? A linguist. The the things about linguistics in this, I, I do love a bunch of it. But then there's a few <laughs> things I was like, well, that's factually not true because I'm very into linguistics. You are. I love linguistics. Um, so I I don't know. That's how I'd like the movie or how I think what happens after if nothing though it is ambiguous enough that you can put what you want on Mm -hmm. it i think the best ending line would be go find your own slippers yes like i think she should have had one more line or just say like oh they're out in the hall yeah and then she comes and sits down and puts her feet up yeah (laughs) like they're where they always are yeah (laughs) yeah but Pours herself a cup of tea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, there should be something more for for her. Mm-hmm. This is her story, and I feel like the movie and apparently all the reviews of the time want to make it his. Mm-hmm. And that's what I don't like about it. Boo, misogyny. Yeah. Also, like all the things about Rex Harrison, everyone's like, he was amazing in this. I don't know that he was. I think he was just good at playing the role. Like He was he'd... fine. He didn't... I feel like a great performance could have done both the, yeah, I don't care about you. I only care about my own stuff, but have something more to that realization of like, oh, this is what she means to me. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like there's nearly enough in that part, but maybe they don't want him to have that realization. Maybe the director is like, no, 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 you're... Just saying like, yeah, she's pretty. That's all you're saying. Yeah. I don't know whose fault it was, but I feel like there isn't enough de- enough depth there. While with Eliza's transformation, we get to see so much. There's so much more depth than I gave it credit for upon my first watching. Because mm-hmm. we have these parts of her not being able to do it to getting it kind of right mm-hmm. with the ascot scene. To just being mistaken for a literal princess. To realizing that... All of this is just a different type of cage. Yeah. It's just one cage to another. Yeah. We have all of that growth in her. And we have him going, I'm a dick. Now I'm a dick who kind of likes you. Yeah. That's about it. Like you're all right. And you can blame the script, the director, or Harrison. I'm not sure where the problem is, but I do think that is a problem with the movie. I'd agree. When it was turned into a musical and Shaw, George Bernard Shaw was still alive, mm-hmm. uh, he said that the ending and he had people like just say the ending because it wasn't always like on stage right that eliza marries freddie and they open up a flower shop with money that pickering gives them oh i like that better i still don't love it because i don't know why she should marry freddie well maybe not this version of freddie right there that freddie might have been different right but this freddie didn't care for her at the beginning of the movie and that sticks with you so that's why i think she can't marry freddie yeah i I think it's really interesting that she says, like, well, I'd have to support Freddie because, like, what is what he can't work. He has no skills. He's so rich or maybe not rich because he doesn't actually have a lot of money. But But he grew up so privileged that he is incapable of doing anything useful. And she knows that going in. Yeah. And it's really interesting to see her say, like, I will marry Freddie over living at your house. Yes. And, like, not having to work, probably, because you are a horrible person. But I want her to, like, have a flower shop. That's what I want. Yeah. Like, that's that's all I want for her. Yeah. If she did the um, goodbye, you won't be seeing me again, and then she doesn't, Mm -hmm. that would be great. Yeah. And then he goes in, and he's just, like, walking down, and he... Sees a flower shop. Sees a flower shop, and she's in there, and then he can just be like... Huh, good for you See, and that walk would have along. Been a really satisfying. That's ending. better. Yes, I would rather that. 
there's also a lot of people who say um, because George Bernard Shaw was gay and he says that Higgins is kind of based upon himself in many ways Mm. that Higgins is gay, which makes a lot of sense as well. And then I'd like him and Pickering to get together. Oh, yeah. And they could just like live there and be friends. And then um, like Eliza can teach linguistics class and still be their friend. Yeah. That would be fine. That would be fine. There's just, of course, that's not going to happen in a musical from 1964. Yeah. (laughs) But maybe in a new version. I don't know. I guess we gave a few different possible endings we would like to see. Yeah. But I think that's where I end on it. Yeah. I love this movie. There's so many good things in it, and I don't need to rehash them. No, you listen to this just, all. Yeah, we just talked but about it. But I do feel like it's missing something at the end. Yeah, I agree. And there are so many other ways they could have ended this. Mm-hmm. And it would have been very satisfying. <laughs> if they came together and like kissed at the end, I could at least straightforward say, like, that ending's bullshit. I mm-hmm. hate it. But this ending, I'm just like, what yeah it kind of does feel like like oh oh like yeah screen goes dark and you're just like hmm that's weird i still think it's bullshit it is bullshit she should have had the final word definitely and a flower shop (laughs) i really want her to have that flower shop yeah me too yeah hashtag flower shop for eliza (laughs) yeah that's perfect (laughs) that'll be our justice for barb yeah Our second sponsor of the episode is the Well Endowed Podcast by the Edmonton Community Foundation. It is hosted and produced by Andrew Paul and Lisa Pruden and explores the impact of passionate people who are working to make Edmonton a strong, vibrant city to live in. The Edmonton Community Foundation helps people create endowment funds. The podcast tells the story of how those endowments intersect with the community. And you can subscribe to the Well Endowed Podcast at thewellendowedpodcast.com. Samantha, do you feel that? What? It's a chill in the air. Oh. Because you know what's coming soon? Is it Spooktober? Almost. (laughs) So we might be starting Spooktober a little bit early, but... Our next episode, we'll each have a spoiler-free thing of the week. Mm -hmm. And then, you know what? We're just getting into it early. We're going to start with our spooky movies starting next week. Yes. We'll let you know what we're watching. We have a special treat for you. The entire month of October and a little bit of September, I think, Yes, is going to be dedicated to one thing. And we're going to have like four bonus episodes. Yes. We're going to have a bunch of episodes in October. Uh, hopefully you like the one thing we're doing i think it'll be fun <laughs> we'll have eight episodes in october in total. um and i am actually really excited because it's something a little bit different from what we've done in past spooktobers yeah one franchise that'll be our our hint yes it is a a prolific franchise so we'll see you next week when we discuss spooky things of the week and how spooky we're gonna get in october Bye, everyone. Woo! Oh, it's already spooky. (laughs) Watch out. But before... Sorry.